So my name is Daniel Moscato. I'm a civil rights activist, and uh, I do debates and talks like this one at universities and conferences all over the country. Uh, I'm on social media, the Wazoo. Please follow me and subscribe and interact with me. I love interacting with people and having conversations about this stuff. Uh, I've got my cards up here. Uh, if anybody would like one, you're certainly welcome to take one. Um, this info is on there, as well as my cell number if you are the texting type or whatever. Um, yeah, so the title of this talk is Triggering Blasphemy and Effective Discussion, How to Talk Religion Without Pissing People Off, um, which is a little bit of a misnomer because I'm actually going to talk about how to piss people off, and then if you want to not do that, then I give some advice about that too. So. Uh, I'm a little under the weather, so I'm probably going to do this seated. Um, it's kind of a low-key talk anyway, but uh, so anyway. Um, I want to start off with some goals about <coughs> excuse me, what, uh, what we're hoping to accomplish here today so that we kind of have something of a measure of whether we did that. Um, and oh, actually, before I, I get started, uh, every time I give a talk, I give away a copy of this book. This has nothing to do with my talk directly. But uh, I think this book is really important, and I encourage people to read it. Um, so I'm going to donate a copy to Sasha. I'll let the officers decide uh, if you want to have it in some kind of library or if somebody would like to just take it. That's, you guys can figure that out. Uh, it's called The Gift of Fear. It's by a man named Gavin DeBecker, who runs a uh, security agency for celebrities and for people who are being stalked and harassed and so on, uh, basically training people how to deal with stalkers and harassers. Uh, this is an invaluable resource for people who do any kind of activism. Um, if you run a business, if you're any kind of public figure, uh, or you know, just these types of things happen to random people too. Uh, especially if you present feminine, uh, this is a really important book to read. Um, so I'm going to leave this here with you guys, um, and uh, I encourage people to check that out. The Gift of Fear by Gavin DeBecker is the name of that. Uh, so getting back to the talk then, uh, as far as what we're doing here today. There's a couple of things that I want to talk about, um, and this is uh, actually part of like a two-part thing, so we're going to skip some stuff um, that's intentional. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is uh, how to improve your effectiveness uh, when you're having conversations about religion and about atheism, and in day-to-day -day conversation type things, and talking about you know with your neighbors or with uh, coworkers or other students at the zoo um, or your roommates or you know, professors or, or whatever, um, and I thought this was especially timely given that you guys are doing your first uh, tabling of the year tomorrow, and I'm going to try to be there as well if I'm, if I'm feeling up to that. I'd love to join you guys. I've, I've got many, many hours of tabling logged, and it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, so we're going to skip the stuff about structured debates because that's not what we're doing here today. Um, it's kind of unfortunate, but in a lot of situations uh, when somebody meets an atheist, that they know is an atheist, that might be the first time or one of only a few times that they've encountered someone who's an out atheist. And it's not really fair, but a lot of times what ends up happening is you kind of represent atheism to that person. And uh, if, if you represent it well or, or kindly um, or, or knowledgeably, that's kind of the impression that people have about atheists. And if you don't, then that's the impression that people walk away with about atheists. And again, that's not really fair, and, and there's, you know, that, that's a whole other thing, but that's kind of the way it is. So what I want to kind of do here today is, is help you be a better representative of atheism if you're an out atheist, if you're talking to people about atheism. And then lastly, just, I hope that we learned something, because that's kind of the point, right? Um, so there's some definitions that we're going to be going over, just so that we're clear on our terms here uh, for what we're talking about in this talk. So when I talk about a discussion, I'm talking about uh, an informal, unstructured um, exchange of ideas. So in, in like anthropology, when you talk about informal and unstructured versus formal and structured, uh, when you're like interviewing people for like you know field research stuff, uh, a formal discussion or formal interview would be like you set an appointment with somebody and say we're doing this anthropology study, and you know we want to talk to people who live in this community or talk to people who fit a certain you know, a set of characteristics and, you know, why don't you come to my office and we'll, we'll blah, blah, blah. So that's a formal interview. Uh, an informal interview would just be like chatting with somebody and, and learning through conversation things about them. 
Um, and that's very valid as a form of anthropological research, uh, but that's kind of the, the idea that I'm talking about, not like setting up an appointment, but just chatting with people. Uh, and then the unstructured part means, um, as opposed to a structured interview where you have like a list of questions that you repeat in the same order with each person that you're interviewing, with an unstructured one, you're, you're talking and the conversation can go all sorts of places. Uh, so that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about a discussion. Um, and uh, it, the other thing I want to point out is that this, this can go on over days or weeks or years. It's, it's, this isn't necessarily, like, a, like I said, like an appointment type of thing. Um, you know, you can have a discussion that, that stops one day because you run out of time and picks up later on over email and, and so on. Um, and the goal in a discussion is to convince the other person to understand and eventually agree with uh, your point of view on some topic. Um, a lot of times, uh, debating is kind of confused or conflated with quarreling, which is something very different. Um, and argument is also kind of conflated with this concept of a quarrel. So an, an argument means something very different from a quarrel. A quarrel is when two people who normally get along are disagreeing with each other, you know, verbally fighting with each other. And that's, that's not what we're talking about when I say argument. That's something very different. That's kind of what we want to avoid. Um, and that's the point of not pissing people off. So an argument in the context of, of this discussion is in the logical sense of a series of premises followed by a conclusion. Uh, so this is like a logic concept, um, and when I talk about arguments today, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, are you guys familiar with the concepts of valid versus invalid? This is familiar stuff. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this, but uh, just uh, to kind of review, or, or if this is new to you, a valid argument is simply an argument that's not a non sequitur, that is the conclusion logically follows from the premises. So. In a valid argument, if the premises are true, the conclusion is guaranteed to be true because the form of it is set up that way. The conclusion follows from those premises. So it doesn't mean that it's a, a true statement, the conclusion, uh, that would depend on if the premises are true. But uh, if it's valid, that means that if the premises are true, the conclusion is true. So for example, like if I said, um, if the dog is asleep, my mother likes to drink tea, the dog is asleep, therefore my mother likes to drink tea. That's not valid because there's no logical connection between my mother's preference for beverages and the dog being awake or asleep. Um, if I said, uh, well, okay, so moving on to like sound versus unsound, this is if it's actually true or not. Uh, a sound argument is something that is, is valid, an argument that's valid and has true premises, so then the conclusion would also be true. Um, so let's just move on from that. Um, so a debate, and, and again, this is not really what we're getting into today, uh, but just so we're clear on terms here, is a, it's a formal structured discussion uh, where opposing points of view are argued you know, formally. Uh, usually you'd have you know, a moderator to keep time and enforce the rules, and uh, you have, in more, more to the point in a debate, you have a central question and one person is arguing the affirmative side of that question, and the other is arguing against that affirmative stance. Um, usually the, the positive claim side goes first, um, and then the negative side argues against that. Uh, it's important to understand that when you have a debate, the negative side is not arguing like the opposite of the claim or some other claim. They're arguing against the arguments or the premises brought up by the first side. Um, so you're arguing against the person's arguments in a, in a debate. Um, and, the, and the major difference also is that in a debate, the, the actors uh, address the audience, not each other, and the goal is to convince the audience uh, of some point, not your opponent. It's extraordinarily rare that in a formal debate you're gonna change your opponent's mind. Uh, that's not really the point. Um, so going back to informal debates or discussions. So I, I have some basic advice for how to get the most out of these. Um, the first thing, and, and this seems like common sense, but this is really important, folks, <laughs> uh, is to be patient. When you're doing tabling, especially when you are looking at these types of things uh, and reading these arguments, uh, it's, you're gonna hear the same stuff over and over and over. And it's very important to remember that just because you've heard some some point argued and refuted a hundred times doesn't mean that that person has ever heard it before. It's usually the case, not always, but usually, that if somebody brings up a point as an argument, as, as a way to convince you of something, they probably think that that's a pretty good argument or they wouldn't bother trying you know, to, to 
talk it out with you. Um, so they probably haven't heard it properly refuted, or at least they haven't allowed it to sink in. Uh, and it's important to be patient and go through that process with them, even if this is the 11th time today that you've done this if you're tabling. Uh, so it's really important to be kind and think of the person that you're talking to as your partner in this discussion, not like a debate opponent. Um, the word kind, it just etymologically, is related to the word kin, like family. And uh, it's, it's important, you know, when you're talking to somebody that you trust and that you respect and that you care about, uh, it's sometimes actually easier to be more critical of, you know, somebody that you're close to than, than trying to be polite and not criticize what someone's saying if you don't know them. So this kind of goes both ways. When I say be kind, I mean, yes, criticize them and, and dig into what they're saying. That's, that's the respectful thing to do. Uh, and, and push past that polite stage of, well, I don't want to argue with you. No, that's why you're there. That's what the point is. But argue, again, doesn't mean quarrel. It just means discuss what you're talking about clearly and effectively. Um, so moving on, uh, it's important to let them speak. Um, if you're ever in a job interview, just a little bit of advice. Uh, psychology research suggests over and over again that the person who does the most talking tends to think that it went really well. So uh, if you can get your interviewer chatting, it's, it's probably going to work in your favor. And this works in discussions like this too. If you're tabling with somebody, um, it doesn't always work this way, but it's, it's not a bad strategy to kind of let them talk about what they believe and you just kind of poke holes in it as needed and nudge things along and ask questions. But if somebody can, for themselves, kind of talk themselves out of why something might be the case, uh, they tend to, first of all, believe it more and it, it, they retain that, that belief longer uh, as opposed to reverting back to their, their old way of looking at it. Um, and, uh, and they understand it better. So that's, that's really the ideal way to do it. But it's important not to let them, it, well, I call it machine gunning, or uh, the other term for this is gish galloping after doing gish from the, uh, the Young Earth Creationism uh, Institute. Uh, so this term was coined gish gallop by uh, Eugenie Scott, if you're familiar with her. Uh, she's, she's really amazing from the National Center for Science Education. Um, basically, what gish galloping is, uh, is when somebody introduces an argument and you refute that argument, but rather than having them say, oh, that's a good point, I hadn't thought of it that way, well, I'm never gonna use that argument again now that I understand that it's wrong. Instead of doing that part of it, they just introduce another one, and then another one, and then they just keep doing this without ever having to say, I was wrong. Uh, so it's important not to let that happen. Um, if somebody you know, brings up an argument and if they understand that it's wrong, they need to say that, and they need to you know, understand why and be able to explain why. Uh, so, if somebody uses a term, and, and this is especially important in, in kind of pluralistic religious society that we live in, uh, it's important that, that you have an, a, a mutual understanding of what these terms mean. There's a lot of different definitions for all sorts of things. If you stop, you know, 100 people on the street and you ask them, what is the definition of God? You're going to get, like, I, I mean, I don't have actual data points for this, but you're going to get a, a lot of different answers. I would guess 90% of them are going to be uh, at least worded differently, if not substantially different from, from what other people are, are going to argue that it is. Um, and, you know, if I would say if people can't even agree on what the definition of God is, then they're not really in, in a good position to be arguing that we should believe in it or, or do what it says. But uh, if somebody uses a term like that, ask them not only to define it, but to justify why they believe that it, that, that definition is accurate um, so that you can really get to the meat of what you're debating. Uh, and this goes for you too. You should define your terms clearly. Uh, there are a lot of words that have specific definitions or definitions that we use uh, in a science context or in a history context that have slightly different definitions um, according to religious people uh, or according to just, you know, lay people. Uh, and if you're going to use especially a scientific term, it's important that you, you spell out what you're talking about. Um, it's important to use appropriate body language. Don't, you know, don't cross your arms, don't huff, look them in the eye. Uh, and with, like when you're tabling, you know, if it's really bright, people wear sunglasses and stuff. Uh, I don't do that when I'm tabling. I have a hat that I wear to keep the side of my face if it's really bright. Uh, but you know, eye contact is useful. It, it communicates a lot about what you're trying to say to somebody with facial expressions and so on. 
Um, and I have written down here head tilt. So what that's about is uh, in, you know, in human body language, there is this uh, tendency to nod when you understand what someone is saying. Uh, and that's kind of a problem because nodding also communicates that you agree with what they're saying. And those are very different things. So what I do is instead of nodding along when somebody is saying something, I go like this. And it's like, oh, I heard that. I'm acknowledging that I heard that. But that doesn't mean I agree with what you're saying. Um, it's just a, a, a nice difference there. Um, you know, lean forward, face the person you're talking to. Don't play on your phone unless you're like actively looking up something, you know. Um, I'm not going to use really much of scripture today, but there's one piece of scripture that I think is worth memorizing or, or at least being very familiar with, and that's 1 Peter 3.15. And uh, it says, uh, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. And obviously, if somebody doesn't want to talk to you about religion, don't like force them. But... If somebody is going to call themselves a Bible-believing Christian, it's important to understand that the Bible actually does explicitly command Christians to give reasons for why they believe what they believe, and especially if they want to take their beliefs and you know apply them to law or ethics or or judgments of other people's behavior. They yeah they need to be able to answer why they think that that is the case or why that's ethical or or why that should be legal or illegal or so on, um, and they should be gentle and respectful in these explanations. That's, I mean, that's literally what it says, to, to do it with gentleness and respect and to give people the reasons when they ask for it. Um, so how many people here, and you, if you don't want to raise your hand, you know, you don't have to, but how many people here are atheists and used to be religious? So pretty much everybody. And how many of you became an atheist or started exploring atheism or developed an interest in atheism based on a conversation uh, either in person or from a video or something with another atheist that, that had some influence. So not everybody, but a couple of people. Uh, talking to atheists definitely influenced my understanding of what atheism was and helped me become one. Uh, there's this kind of idea that one-on-one -on -one conversations are a waste of time because they're inefficient. Uh, and you know, if you could be giving a speech or writing an article that's gonna reach hundreds of thousands of people, why would you have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about this with anyone? I, I strongly disagree with that perspective. One-on-one uh, -on -one conversations really, really work, and that's why churches do missionary work where they go door-to-door -door and talk to people. I mean, they, they know that it's very time-consuming. They know that there are safety issues with doing that, especially you know, in other parts of the world. The reason they do it is because it's extraordinarily effective. And uh, I'm not saying that we should start going door to door, but what I'm saying is if somebody wants to have a conversation with you about atheism, um, it, it's not necessarily a great idea to immediately refer them to a YouTube channel or a book. Uh, talking to them is also very effective, especially because there is a community aspect of atheism that a lot of people who aren't atheists are, are either unaware of or deny exists. Um, and that's, that's very much a part of, of this. I mean, as, as we can see here, that's something that, that exists for reasons. Um, so when you're chatting with somebody like this, another good piece of advice, I think, is, as I said, don't jump right to this, but do offer these kinds of resources. There are a bunch of books. There are a bunch of YouTube channels, uh, podcasts, I mean, and, and local groups and so on, where people can learn more about atheism, more about science, uh, more about logic and so on, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel, I and mean, you don't have to offer all of this in person, one on one. There are you know, resources out there that you can give to somebody, and they can learn this for themselves uh, at their own pace and following their own interest in it. I also do think it's important to get the contact information of the person that you're talking to, uh, so that you can follow up with them and see how they're doing, and check in, and just say, I wonder if you had questions or if you wanted to talk more about this or if there was anything that you found that you didn't understand or disagreed with, or something I said that you found something that disagreed with, or, you know, whatever. Uh, this is how progress is made, and uh, I think that's important to do. So, uh, some more advice. Uh, when you're having these kinds of discussions, um, generally it's a pretty decent idea to start 
the conversation with the reasons that the believer has for their belief, rather than bringing up an argument against belief. Uh, different people have different reasons for believing, and, and one of the questions I get asked a lot is, what's the best argument against belief in God? And it's like, that's not how that works. Different people believe for different reasons. Some people legitimately think that the, you know, the Jesus story is historically true. And if you start talking to them about the historical problems with the, the New Testament and with that account historically, that can help them understand that they're wrong. If they believe for a completely different reason, then talking about the history of the New Testament is not going to be effective. Uh, it's best, in my experience, just to ask them, well, why do you believe? Why do you think this is true? Let's talk about those reasons one by one and go through them and I can explain to you why you're wrong. <laughs> uh, so along those lines, don't bring up an argument uh, unless you know it pretty well. Uh, I'm not saying that, that you should ignore arguments that you don't know. Um, and it's okay to say, you know, I don't, I don't have a good answer to that. Um, but when that happens, say, but we can look this up. You know, this is a university. There are professors who are literally experts in all the things that we're talking about. We can go talk to one. Or we can, you know, Google this, and there are scholarly articles. And, um, you know, just make sure that you're looking at a legitimate source when you, when you do that kind of thing. But uh, it's okay to say that you don't know. That's an answer that, in my experience, a lot of religious people are not used to hearing. They're used to having bullshit fed to them, and they, they're used to hearing some kind of answer, even if it's not a good one. Uh, our goal is not to have an answer, even if it's not a good one. Our goal is to have the correct information, or to say, I don't know, but let's find out. Um, so that's, that's a good mindset to get into. It's important not to let your conversation partner uh, commit the fallacy of appealing to ignorance while we're on this topic. Um, the fallacy of appeal to ignorance says that, I don't know, therefore God did it, or therefore is a miracle, and that's that's fallacious, that's not how that works. If you don't know how something happened or if something happened, the best that you can say is, I don't know, that's, I mean, that's really the end of what you can say about that. You can follow up with that by saying, let's go find out. But it's a very different statement to say, I don't know how this happened, therefore it was God. That, that is a fallacy that it's important to call out. Uh, an appeal to incredulity is similar, uh, in, and it's also something you have to watch out for. Um, that is basically where somebody has an answer for how something worked, but doesn't understand it because it takes more uh, of a formal background in some subject than they have, um, or they just don't like it and they're not ready to hear it, so they deny it and they say, I don't really believe that, therefore it was God. Um, it doesn't really matter whether you, it's sort of right how, the, how that phrase goes. Uh, science doesn't care whether you believe it or not. It's, it's true regardless. Um, are you familiar with the Socratic method is this, is this new to everybody? I'm just going to briefly explain it. Uh, so really simplified and boiled down and, and leaving out a lot. The Socratic method is basically just uh, being annoying. <laughs> it's asking annoying, not, not on purpose being annoying, but it's, it's asking nudging questions to try to urge somebody to understand where the holes in their arguments are. And it doesn't often take very, very many words to do this. Uh, if somebody gives you know, an explanation of something, you can kind of just say, why do you think that's true? <laughs> or are you sure about that? Or like, you know, have you thought, just you know, little questions like that and let them do most of the explaining and talk themselves out of that belief. Um, asking questions is, is really a great way to help people understand the problems and what they're saying. Uh, so some additional advice is uh, keep your voice even. Uh, this subject can get pretty heated for some people. This is an emotional topic for a lot of people. A lot of people's identities are closely tied in with these beliefs, and it can, it can come up that if you start picking apart these beliefs, you start poking someone's identity, and that can cause emotions to rise. So if you keep your voice even, it helps the other person keep their emotions in check too, and you can have a much more fruitful discussion uh, throughout the length of or you're talking about this, um, it's just something to, to keep in mind. It's, I'm not saying don't be passionate about what you're saying. I'm not saying don't don't feel emotion to help you guide what you care about. But uh, don't yell at the person even if they say something crazy or, or horrible. Um, so when you're having these kinds of discussions, I mean, like I said, it's not like a formal, you know, structured thing. But it is useful to sometimes direct things back to what you're talking about. If you're out there tabling, you're representing the group, if you want to have a discussion, 
and, and form a friendship, you are certainly welcome to do that. I'm not going to discourage that. But uh, if you're there to talk about religion and somebody wants to you know, preach to you or something, it's okay to say, I'm not here for that. Let's not talk about that. Um, for some reason, a lot of people have this concept that like taking notes during these types of discussions is like rude or something. I don't get that. Uh, I don't think so. I think it's very helpful in uh, keeping track of what you're talking about. If you need to look up stuff later, if you want to refer back to what somebody said word for word, um, it's okay to take notes when I when I want to meet with somebody to talk about this kind of stuff, even if it's you know at a restaurant for lunch to talk about. Well, I, I bring a notepad and I write it down. Um, that's not a bad thing to do. Uh, and, and that also allows you then to follow up with resources and links and so on to, to follow up on what you were talking about. I'm going to speed this up a little bit. So as far as where discussion looks like, this picture was taken a couple of years ago at Speaker's Circle. Um, right before this photo was taken, Brother Jed, you guys are familiar with Brother Jed, he's the traveling campus preacher, he comes here every once in a while to spew nonsense. Uh, he is sitting right there. Uh, and basically what happened was he was preaching in the center of the circle and I was calling out all the things that he was saying that were historically inaccurate or just scientifically inaccurate or didn't follow from another and so on. And he got annoyed enough that he just sat down. <laughs> and a lot of people wanted to talk to me about what I was saying and so we had this discussion, that's me here, with these people. This lasted about four hours, like past sunset. Uh, of us talking about this stuff. And three of the people in this photo, I think they'd be okay with me saying this, uh, are now atheists because of this day. And this stuff, you know, this works. This is how you can talk to people and change people's minds and help them understand that what they believe might not be actually true, uh, or what they've been taught might not be actually true. And, you know, I love it when Brother Jed or the other campus preachers come to town because, you know, frankly, this gets the discussion started and this is how we do what we do. Um, it's okay to, to have these kinds of discussions with people. Um, so, with credit to J.T. Everhart for, for looking at this, when you're having these types of discussions, it's important to have a couple basic precepts in mind. Uh, if, you're, if you're talking to somebody, kind of a good filtering first question is, is there anything that you can imagine that would change your mind on this issue? And if there's nothing that would do that, then yeah, you actually are wasting your time. I, I said earlier that you know one-on-one -on -one isn't a waste of time. Sometimes it is a waste of time. If somebody is not ready, willing, or able to even hear you out, if there's nothing that would change their mind, then you know move on to somebody who, who is interested in having a real discussion about this type of stuff. Uh, if one of your reasons is shown to be wrong, will you agree to stop using it forever? with everyone. <laughs> if somebody doesn't agree to this, they are intellectually dishonest and there's not really much to be gained from trying to change their mind either. Uh, in my experience, a lot of the people who won't agree with this one uh, actually don't necessarily believe what they're saying in the first place, but their income depends on it uh, or they have social pressure to pretend to believe and it's, it's not so much that they don't believe, or excuse me, it's not so much that they do and they need to understand why what they're saying is inaccurate, it's that they they don't want to be wrong on this. And if that's the issue, then showing them information that they are wrong is not going to solve that problem. Um, do you agree to follow some basic rules of discussion? Uh, for example, don't do the gish galloping thing. Provide one reason at a time, um, and then once it's been shown to be wrong, you know, explain that you understand that it's wrong and move on from that uh, without using it again. Uh, provide evidence for your positions. Uh, don't say, I don't, I just have faith, I don't need evidence. That's not how reasoning works. Um, don't move on, you know, to uh, a new reason or a new question if some fact that you brought up from your, your previous argument was shown to be faulty um, and, and you're building reasoning upon that one uh, and so on. Just basic, you know, a, a basic form for how this should look. Uh, it's important to understand that a discussion like this is not a sermon. Uh, often in these situations, someone will think that this is a good opportunity to start preaching to you, and if you don't want that, um, you don't have to deal with that. You don't have to put up with that. It's not polite to, uh, it's, it's not like you have to be polite and sit there and let someone preach at you. What I usually say is like, you know, if I, if I wanted to be preached at, 
I would go to church and I would listen to somebody who does this for a living um, and is you know, probably pretty decent at it. Uh, I don't do that because I don't want that. And if you're here to ask me questions about atheism, like the sign says, then I'm here to answer your questions about atheism, like the sign says. Uh, this is not a time for you to convert me. Um, and similarly, it's not a lecture either. It's important to, as I said before, let them do the bulk of the talking and ask questions as necessary and follow these rules yourself. I think that's very self-explanatory. So uh, I do another talk about belief versus knowledge and epistemology, so I'm gonna skip a lot of this. But uh, the takeaway of that talk is that just because you believe something doesn't mean that it's true. Belief is often misstated as knowledge by religious people. They will uh, often, in my experience, state something as though it's a fact when it's actually a belief. And it is totally fine to say that may be more belief, but is that actually true? You can call them out on that and you can ask them to clarify or justify. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson has a good statement, and I, well, arguably good. I have a, a, what I think is a better version. He says, one of the best questions you can ask is, how do you know that? I actually don't like that phrasing. I say, why do you believe that? They're slightly different questions. Um, the first one in Something else that comes up a lot in these types of discussions is, uh, it's, a, it's a type of straw man, but basically someone, when they are trying to justify why what they believe is true, will start telling you what they believe. And that's a very different set of statements and claims. And it's important if somebody starts to tell you, well, the Bible says blah, 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 blah. It's like, that's not the question. The question was, why do you think this is true in reality? And if you're saying, I believe it because the Bible says it, okay, that's a claim that we can talk about and break down. Um, but just because the Bible says it, that's not a justification for why it's really actually true in the world. Um, you know, I, I know what the Bible says, I've read it too. That's not, that's not the question. Uh, are you familiar with The Outsider Test for Faith by John Loftus? Uh, John Loftus is a former preacher. He is now an uh, atheist writer and activist and uh, has a bunch of books about this stuff. But he introduced, I'm sure he wasn't like the first person in history to come up with this idea, but he's the person who's credited with kind of formalizing the, the, the statement of it. So The Outsider Test for Faith, OTF, um, is this idea that uh, the question isn't really what would it take you to convince that um, that your religion is true. So, you know, somebody might say, well, the Bible, blah, 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 okay. The question is really, what would someone who doesn't believe your religion, uh, excuse me, what would it take to convince you that any religion is true? So that's kind of a different standard. People uh, often, when you, when you ask it this way, they have a bit of a different set of, uh, a different threshold of, of evidence or logic for why they think their own religion is true versus why they might think that a religion is true. So in, in his words, I'm just gonna read this. Uh, tell believers to examine their faith critically. And most of the time they'll say that they already do, but tell them to subject their own faith to the same level of skepticism they use when examining the other religious faiths they reject, and that will get their attention. Some of the best critics of Christianity that I know are religious people. There are Muslims or Hindus or Buddhists who can explain in great detail why Christianity is wrong. Similarly, there are a lot of Christians who are very skilled and knowledgeable explaining why Islam is not true, but they don't hold their own beliefs to that same level of criticism. And, and they, even if they have the knowledge to do it, they don't, they don't apply it that way. So that's really what the outsider test for faith is about, is being, being non-hypocritical in this, in this endeavor. So I'm gonna speed this up a little bit because we've got about 20 minutes left here. Um, I wanna talk about understanding how belief works uh, and, and what people do in real life with their beliefs versus kind of what they say they do. Uh, so in practice, when you're having these kinds of discussions, it's very common in my experience for religious people to discuss or defend deism, uh, which is the belief in some creator thing, <laughs> which is not what Christians believe. Um, and you know, you hear a lot of arguments along the lines of like, well, something can't come from nothing. Um, that's arguable in physics, but even aside from that, that's not an argument for Christianity. If somebody wants to argue that, you know, Jesus is the savior who can send us to heaven instead of hell if we believe in him and rose from the dead after three days and souls survive our deaths and souls exist and heaven exists and hell exists, those are all sets of like specific beliefs that you would need to justify individually and, and collectively if you want to believe Christianity is true as a claim. If somebody says, 
I believe all of these, you know, 17 specific things because something can't come from nothing. I'm like, you think you skipped like a couple of steps in there. Um, so it's important to, to kind of call that out. Um, and the more specific, the better. I mean, if somebody wants to claim, you know, as a lot of these street preachers do, that, that uh, same-sex marriage is wrong or that abortion is wrong or, you know, any of these, especially things that affect other people's rights, um, they need to be able to justify why that specific thing is immoral or should be illegal or so on. Um, and just, you know, just saying something can't come from nothing doesn't address any of those. Uh, so this is maybe a little bit of dirty pool, but it's effective, I think. Um, if you're talking to somebody who believes in one of the Abrahamic religions, um, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Mormonism, and so on, uh, one of the things I like to bring up is the Ten Commandments. This is something that a lot of religious people will argue vehemently is so important as a foundation, not just for religious life, um, but you know, for, for the whole of the, the culture that we live in, that this should be enshrined in a monument in front of our courthouses. Uh, you know, I mean, if, if we're looking for a list of ten things that are really the basis of American government, I would say the Bill of Rights is a pretty good candidate for that, but if we have to have a list of ten things, you know, which we don't. Anyway, a lot of people would argue that, that the Ten Commandments are that valuable. And I would say, like, can you list those for me? Like, is, is this that important to you? You know, do you know them? You'd be kind of surprised how many people can't, or maybe you wouldn't, but I think it's, it's kind of funny um, and, and can be useful to show people that they're hypocritical about these beliefs. Um, it's also kind of, I think, useful to point out that uh, it's pretty easy to kind of improve on the morals of the Bible. Um, for example, you know, people say that the, the Bible is like the greatest moral teaching that exists or could ever exist or, or other hyperbole like that. And it's like, you know, it doesn't say in the Ten Commandments not to own people, you know, as slaves. It doesn't say not to rape people, and those are things that I think most people today would agree are, are almost inarguably unethical. Um, and it's not like there was some reason this had to be 10 commandments instead of 12 commandments. Like if God really wanted those in there, he could have put those in there, uh, according to the story. So I think it's, it's actually kind of telling that those things aren't in there. Um, it's, it's worth pointing out, I think. Um, another good line of reasoning, if somebody believes the Bible, why don't they believe the Quran? And like I said, people come up with those sorts of reasons um, and, and can even sound quite knowledgeable about it, but this comes back to that outsider test for faith. Um, there's something called Jebediah's Wager that Seth Ehrenbach, uh, who used to be in this group actually, he's, he's graduated now, uh, did a talk about once. Um, this, this idea of Jebediah's Wager, you guys familiar with Pascal's Wager? Um, so it's basically the same argument. So Pascal basically said, well, you know, you can either believe or not believe, and the payoff for believing is you go to heaven, and the penalty for not believing is you go to hell, if it's true, and there's no, you know, there's no upside or downside if it's not true, so you might as well believe just in case. Um, so Seth took this a step further and said, okay, so let's look at this from the perspective of uh, an Amish person, and it's like, Okay, well why don't, why don't all Christians practice this extremely strict form of Christianity of, of you know, being Luddites and, and giving up technology and, and following all these rules very strictly about you know, not cutting your hair and so on? Um, well, because we, we have rejected those things as not important. Uh, and it's like, what's your basis for believing this? You know, just in case, what if God really does care about those things? They're in the Bible, maybe we should follow them? You all, Christians, by and large, already reject a lot of this stuff, and it's, it's really pretty uh, arbitrary why they do that, um, so this can help make that more clear. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to skip a couple things just because we are a little short on time, but um, I do want to talk a little bit about, uh, let's see, yeah, so let's, let's talk about blasphemy. I would argue that this is the most important difference between religious people and secular people or people who, who don't have any kind of uh, miracle beliefs in, in their system of thinking. Um, 
Blasphemy is, just to give us a definition here so we're on the same page, the act of insulting or showing contempt or lack of reverence for God or sacred thing. Uh, so in, you know, in atheists' view of the world, in atheists' view of the world, there really is no such thing as sacred things. We don't, we don't really have that concept. Um, and so lacking reverence for something that's sacred isn't really something that we deal with. But this is, I mean, this is really the basis of Jewish law um, and the Jesus myth and Islamic law. And it's extraordinarily important to religious people, even if they, they don't necessarily talk about it all the time. Um, as far as the Jesus myth, I mean, this is explicitly why Jesus was executed, was because he blasphemed. Uh, he, according uh, to the story, um, I'm just going to read this. This is from Matthew 26. Uh, the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Uh, Jesus said, yes, it is as you say. Uh, but I say to all of you in the future, you will see blah, blah, blah. Okay. The high priest tore his clothes and said, he has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Uh, this was at his trial. Uh, you know, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? Uh, he is worthy of death, they answered. And then they executed him. So, I mean, the, the point was, he was claiming to be a god. That is totally not okay in Judaism. That's why they killed him. I mean, that's the whole basis of the story. So I think it's, it's worth understanding that this is really important to people, um, even if they, they don't necessarily spell it out. Uh, in Christianity and in Islam, um, doubting religion itself is blasphemous in, in certain forms of it. And this can be uncomfortable for people to talk about. Uh, because they've been taught that this is not okay to do. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind as well. Uh, I hate to kind of rush through this because these are some important slides. Um, this stuff is, is not like academic. Uh, a lot of the people on the slide are dead. And I know some of these people. And the reason that they're dead is because they said blasphemous things. They talked about the fact that they're atheists on a blog. Or they criticized Islam as not treating women well. Um, I mean, it's, you know, I, I need to take a second to talk about this slide because there are some important things here. Uh, Raif Badawi, this man, I'm pretty good friends with his wife. Uh, he has been sentenced to a thousand lashes and 10 years in jail and a $250,000 fine. His lawyer, whose crime was representing him in his defense, got 15 years for defending him. Uh, he was supposed to get so if you, if you do a thousand lashes to a person, they're going to die. That's just how that works. So the way that they do this is 50 per week uh, until you have a thousand. Um, they've been po postponed for now, but he's still in prison in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia right now. Uh, and he has kids and you know he's married. And his crime was saying that Islam has problems on a blog, it, anonymously, <laughs> by the way. Um, uh, this man here, Vijit Roy, I'm sorry, Asif Mahidin, this guy, uh, he's a friend of mine. He, uh, he's from Bangladesh. Um, he also has a blog where he writes about atheism. And uh, some men who found his blog and identified him as the synonymous author uh, followed him home from work and stabbed him uh, with a machete. Um, he had to go to the hospital for a month. Uh, those men were arrested. Um, for doing that, for assaulting him, but uh, because he was found out to be an atheist, which is against the law in Bangladesh, uh, as soon as he was healthy enough to leave the hospital, he was going to be sent to prison for the rest of his life. Um, and the craziest part is, there was a riot because of that sentence of life in prison, because uh, the people of Bangladesh wanted him to be executed, not just sentenced to life in prison. Um, He's uh, currently living in Germany uh, as a refugee there, but um, he's a really sweet kid. He's, you know, he's younger than I am, and his crime is, is criticizing Islam. And you know, he, he's, it, this is ridiculous stuff that we have to argue this, but my point is there are real world consequences to this type of thing. Um, I'm gonna skip over some of this. Uh, talking about Charlie yeah, Pesto. So you know, yeah. um, like we're not obligated to leave the room at like 8 o'clock. Like we okay. Oh, so. all right. Um, in that case, I will I will go through some more of this, and if anybody needs to leave at 8, that's totally not going to be offended. Um, so, actually, yeah, let's talk about Charlie Hebdo. Do you guys remember this? Mm -hmm. In 2015, 
uh, on January 7th, two Muslim men went into the Charlie Hebdo offices in Paris and killed 11 people and injured 11 other people, killed a cop who was outside responding to the call of shootings. Uh, there was another attack in a grocery store down the street as they were fleeing. Uh, five more people were killed, 11 more people were shot. Um, because uh, this magazine published this picture, it's a cartoon, it, sure, it's in poor taste, I mean, fine, but the point is, nobody should die because they publish a cartoon. I think that's something most people should agree on. Um, after, uh, after those killings, uh, the Charlie Hebdo magazine continued publishing. Um, they originally were going to print uh, 60,000 copies of the next issue. This says all was forgiven. Um, but there was such attention and demand for a copy of that that they raised the run up to a million copies, uh, which immediately sold out and raised it to five million copies and immediately sold out and then printed eight million. Um, I have one of them actually. Um, but yeah, this is uh, for, for drawings, you know. As Sam Harris says, yeah. you can be killed for drawing a cartoon. End of moral analysis. <laughs> I mean, this is not this is not moral stuff we're talking about. The night after this happened in Republic Square in Paris, I've been here actually. There was a vigil uh, with all these people supporting the magazine, and I mean, this is the country, by the way, where they're banning you know wearing of burqas. They're not exactly supportive of Islam there, but. Um, they do believe in freedom of religion. This is where the, the phrase, Je suis Charlie, I am Charlie, was coined. Uh, lots of people holding up signs that say, Je suis Charlie, holding up pens. Here's some more photos. So, I mean, what, what is going on in people's brains? Why is blasphemy? I mean, it's not, it's not like we're physically hurting somebody. Why does it cause these kinds of reactions in people that they're willing to kill people over this stuff. So that's, that's kind of what I want to talk about here. There's this process in neuroscience called amygdala hijacking. This is the most research on this is from Daniel Goldman, who's a psychologist at Harvard, and Joseph Ledoux, who's a neuroscientist at NYU uh, in their respective books, Emotional Intelligence and Synaptic Self. Um, so amygdala hijacking is well, let me talk about what it looks like first, or what causes it. There's three signs that this is going on in your brain. Um, the first is a strong emotional reaction. The second is a sudden onset, and the third is a realization afterward that the reaction was disproportionate to the stimulus. Um, surprise plays a very important role in this process of amygdala hijacking. Uh, and this comes back into what I was talking about earlier in the title as far as trigger warnings, uh, if, if you can notify someone that they're about to view offensive material or that they're about to have a conversation about something that might offend them or might be difficult for them to process, that can short circuit this, this whole problem. It, it, it tends not to happen if they know it's, you know, if they, they've got a little bit of warning. It's really not that big of a deal to just let somebody know. Uh, it gives them some time to mentally prepare and helps them engage more with the material uh, if they have that that second of notice. Um, it's, it's like, you know, they say, like, the secret to humor is surprise. It ruins the joke if you've heard the joke before. Uh, and you can flip this around. If you, if you don't want something to be funny, you can spoil the joke. Similarly, if you don't want to trigger somebody, you can let them know a trigger is on its way. Um, that's just how that works. And this, this uh, research comes from a guy named Jaclyn, um, who studied uh, desensitization and video games that are violent and uh, and I've got a lot of problems with his research actually but um, as far as phobia treatment in the parallel here um, there's a man named uh, Joseph Wolpe in the 1950s who really came up with the first uh, clinically effective way to treat phobias uh, and he developed this 13-step process and I'm going to use 
uh, arachnophobia, that's fear of spiders, uh, as an example of how this desensitization process works uh, as a phobia treatment clinically. Um, so just trigger warning, if you're sensitive to discussion about spiders, if you have arachnophobia, I'm gonna be talking about spiders. Uh, see how easy that was? It's really not that big a deal. Um, so this 13 step process looks like this, if you wanna desensitize somebody. The first step, uh, if you have arachnophobia, you, know, you do this in a safe place, you do this in a therapist's office under controlled conditions where you know you're safe. Uh, and the first step is to think about a spider. And once you can do that comfortably, without having you know, an anxiety attack, um, the next step is to look at a cartoon or a silly drawing of a spider. And then once you're comfortable doing that, and you, know, you, can, you can do this and you know you're in a safe place, then the third step in desensitization is to look at a realistic drawing of a spider. Uh, and then the next step after that is to look at a photograph of a spider. Uh, and then the next step is to look at an actual real spider web, but without a spider, just an empty spider's web. Um, once you can do that comfortably, be in a room with one, the next step is to touch an empty spider's web. The next step is to look at a real spider in a box across the room from you. The next step is to hold that box. The next step is to look at a spider not in a box across the room. Uh, the tenth step is to look at a spider not in a box halfway across the room. The eleventh step is to look at a spider up close. The twelfth step is to have a spider crawl on something you're holding. And then the thirteenth step, if you know, once you can do all of this without having anxiety attack, and you know, this can take weeks or months, is to have the spider crawl in your hand. And at the point that you can have a spider crawl in your hand without having an anxiety issue, I mean, you're effectively cured of arachnophobia at that point. So the point is, uh, to bring this you know, to religion, as atheists, we've been desensitized to frank discussion about blasphemous topics. We don't, we don't see this stuff as blasphemous because we don't have this sense of sacrilege. Um, and we talk about this stuff a lot at meetings like this. And if you're not used to doing that, uh, it can trigger you. I mean, surprise, surprise. Um, you know, and as I said, you know, even doubting religion, just you know, thought crimes are, are against Islam and some forms of Christianity. Um, it's, it's actually kind of encouraged in Judaism, that's another topic. But, uh, so let's talk about like, what, what physically happens, what actually happens in this process of medial hijacking. So there's actually two parts of your brain. Amygdala is Latin for almond, and they're almond-shaped. There's one on each side, this is the amygdala right there. So the way this works, stimuli come into your brain through your senses. Uh, you know, you can hear something or see something that can trigger you. So this represents stimuli, it comes in, stimulus, excuse me. So what happens is it comes in and it goes to this part of the brain, it's called the thalamus. And the thalamus is kind of the, like in an airport, you have the air traffic control, that's, it does other stuff too, but basically it decides where to route incoming traffic, uh, incoming signals. So uh, if it's visual input, it goes to the occipital lobe back here. That's the part of the brain that processes visual input. Uh, and then the occipital lobe says, uh, okay, well, we, we can see what we're seeing now, and let's figure out what to do with that. So it sends that information to the amygdala for uh, basically emotional processing, the part of the brain that, it's a little more complicated than this, but the part of the brain that is responsible for deciding what kind of emotional reaction to have to, to the stimulus. So this is the normal process. Comes in here, goes to there, comes back to here. Roundabout process take some time, just to give you an idea, like when you hear two auditory stimuli, if they're less than about 30 milliseconds apart, you perceive them as a single sound. You can't, our brains can't process stimuli faster than that. Um, so sometimes the thalamus gets information that it says, holy shit, I, we don't have time to deal with this here. Uh, this is an urgent problem, we're in danger, we need to have the emotional aspect introduced faster than that. So it does this thing called amygdala hijacking where it sends the signal directly to the amygdala for emotional processing. Um, and this is where uh, you, you do things like uh, uh, release peptides and hormones and um, it prepares your, your body for what's called mus uh, violent muscular action, uh, releases uh, adrenaline that speeds up 
your heart rate and your breathing, um, your bronchi and your lungs dilate, your pupils dilate, your blood vessels and your muscles dilate and constrict certain other blood vessels in extreme cases, you lose control of your bladder. Uh, it's the fight or flight response, that's what's going on. It prepares you to, to deal with this, this urgent uh, you know, threat. Uh, and you can trigger that for good reasons, like you're about to be attacked by a bear, or you can trigger it for useless reasons, like you saw a drawing. Um, so this process takes a millisecond, one. Um, and the important part here is that this part of your brain, the neocortex, which is the newest, evolutionarily speaking, part of the brain, <coughs> brain evolved, you know, from the inside out. These are the oldest limbic system, the oldest animal parts of the brain. This part of the brain that does all the logical thinking, <coughs> that does processing of language, uh, logic, is not consulted in this process. And what I mean by not consulted is people, I mean, when I say that like they shut down, that's, I'm not being, you know, figurative here. You, you literally have more trouble or the inability to process what someone is saying when this process is happening. Because the part of your brain that processes language is not in the equation. Uh, it doesn't matter what you say when someone is triggered, they can't hear you. That's not, the part of the brain that listens to language is not part of it. Um, so, as far as what this looks like, the key word here is sheltered. Uh, when we're talking to people who are, who are triggered by this kind of stuff. And like I said, you know, as atheists, we're the opposite of this. We are exposed to this, we're desensitized to this stuff. We gotta remember, you know, it is entirely possible, and this is especially true in like, you know, mandatory Muslim countries, but in the United States, you, you see this too, where it's possible to go your entire life, you know, from a, a Christian daycare to a Christian private school using textbooks published by Christian textbook publishing companies, watching TV by Christian TV networks, listening to broadcasts from Christian radio stations, listening to Christian music, reading Christian inspirational fiction, going to Christian summer camps and Christian colleges and Christian hospitals and Christian retirement homes. It is impossible, it is, it is possible to go your entire life as a Christian in this country without any real meaningful interaction with anyone who isn't Christian. And what that means is that if somebody who's in that kind of insular environment uh, is exposed to an atheist, that might, you know, that might be hugely triggering for them because they're so sheltered. Um, just the word atheist uh, on a t-shirt or a sign can be triggering for certain people and cause amygdala hijacking in certain people. Um, and as I said, you know, the important thing here is just remember that you've been desensitized for this. Um, it's important to keep in mind that this stuff is relative to what you've experienced before and where your mind is at. Um, and I, I want you to think you know, when we're talking about this stuff, think of these desensitization steps, the phobia steps that we talked about. If you're trying to avoid giving someone a panic attack and you're like, you know, okay, I understand that you don't want a spider crawling on your hand because that's a pretty big jump, but how about you touch a spider's web with a spider in it, right? That's not so bad. And it's like, you know, for someone who isn't ready for that, especially if they have arachnophobia, like that, that can be a serious problem. You don't want to start at step 10, you know? Uh, if someone is at, is at level two of desensitization, you need to meet them at like level three, even if that feels ridiculous to you because you are at step 13. Um, I'm not saying, you know, don't use cuss words when you're talking to people, when you're tabling, speak in mind. Um, and in fact, there's some research that suggests that cursing can be effective in, in communicating that you are passionate and, uh, and believe what you're saying and that you're speaking true things. Um, but it can be shocking to people who are sheltered and, and aren't used to hearing that kind of language. Uh, I have a friend um, who uh, is extraordinarily Christian uh, who says some pretty, f he's, okay, like he doesn't say goddamn or even gosh darn because that's too strong. He says, good night, Irene. <laughs> okay. Um, and he doesn't say shit, he says sugar shells. And it's like, if, if you say goddamn around someone like that, uh, he's not going to be able to hear whatever the next thing you have to say is or understand your point uh, because he's going he's gonna to be pearl clutching, right? That's, that's not where he is. Um, 
and, and it, it can be kind of surprising when we're talking about you know what kinds of things could be triggering to somebody if you're just if you're not aware of this stuff if you're not experienced with it just the the word God just that name is blasphemous in, in Judaism it's actually if you read the Old Testament this uh, tetragrammatron this uh, four-letter spelling of God are pronounced Yahweh they don't have vowels in Hebrew um, you're not supposed to say that Jewish people don't say this word um, in fact, a lot of Jewish people, in my experience, are not even aware that this is God's actual name because that didn't, they don't use that word. Uh, they use Hashem, which is Hebrew for the name, <laughs> because they don't say it, or Adonai is the more common one, which just means master. Um, and when you're reading the book, um, you know, translations will actually use those words instead. Um, but in, you know, in the original text, if you're reading in Hebrew and you're, and you're reading it out loud, you're supposed to substitute those words because you don't say it. Um, so, skipping a little bit here, um, I'll tell the story real fast. So I was tabling once at Mizzou and I had a copy of the Bible with me and I was moving some stuff around because I needed to get to a different book and I took it off the table and I set it on the ground, touching the table leg, just leaning it against it while I moved some things. And this guy I was talking to freaked the fuck out. He was extraordinarily upset that I had let this book touch the ground because apparently in Judaism, you're not supposed to do that. And he insisted that I pick it up and kiss it and put it back on the table. And I said, no, <laughs> no, I'm not doing that. Um, but that's what you're supposed to do in, in some forms of Judaism when, um, when a, a Bible or a, in, you know, the Torah touches the ground, you're supposed to kiss it. You're not supposed to let that happen. Um, and I mean, that was triggering for him, you know, that's, I, you, you, I, I didn't know that, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, just when you're tabling, you know, be aware of the type of stuff to it. I'm not saying don't wear shirts that say the word atheist on it, but just, but understand that there are certain people who are not going to be able to begin a conversation with you about your beliefs if you're wearing that piece of clothing. Um, or in some cases, you know, if, if you're not wearing a head covering, that, that can be tricky for people. Um, so to just pull this together, when we're talking about Blasphemy. This is culturally dependent. What is blasphemous to me? Nothing, really. Nothing is sacred, right? Um, somebody who's been desensitized to it, somebody, you know, if they're religious but they're very familiar with atheists, they have atheist friends, if they've been to atheist meetings or conferences or whatever, if they watch atheist YouTube videos, they're, they're quite a different level of desensitization to blasphemy from somebody who is under the belief or impression that even talking about atheists is the devil trying to draw you away from Jesus and that atheists are like literally Satan, you know. Uh, you have to meet people where they are. Um, if you want to cause a mental hijacking in a discussion, uh, I, I don't really recommend this, but there are certain cases where it works. And I'm not saying, I, I'm, not, I'm not really recommending this, but there are certain situations where when someone has a, a controlled exposure to something that they're uncomfortable with, it can help them grow to a point of understanding that their discomfort with it is not rational, um, and help them understand that you have a right to talk about this stuff, that you have a right to believe what you want, and that they are being unreasonable. Like I said, the third step of amygdala hijacking is a post-episodic realization that their response is disproportionate and, you know, to the stimulus. Um, so if you want to cause that, be careful doing this, uh, challenge your conversation partner um, to see them get uncomfortable if you start to do this and you do it too fast or too soon um, watch their body language um, watch their tone of voice you know if they're if they stop speaking in full sentences uh, and start to shut down you know be aware of that back off a little bit maybe say you know why don't we pick this up tomorrow or change the subject or you know something um, if somebody shuts down, they're not, they're not going to be able to get anything out of the, the conversation at that point anyway. Um, but if you want to salvage it, you can back off and try again in a little while. Uh, if you want to avoid amygdala hijacking, um, the basic thing to remember is those phobia steps. Um, do this in baby steps. Meet them where they are. Go one, one tiny step ahead of where they are, desensitization-wise. And push them a little bit at a time with just nudging questions criticizing some things that they're saying that might not make sense and, and let them figure it out for themselves slowly. 
uh, in their own words at their own pace, um, and they're going to get a lot more out of it that way. It's important to avoid surprises by giving somebody a warning if you're about to talk about something horrible um, or, or what they would perceive as horrible even if you don't. It's really easy to do this. You can just say, you know, I mean, in a sentence, I know this might be uncomfortable for you to consider, but I think it's important to point out that, and then say it. it that's all it takes, but it helps somebody kind of mentally, you know, prep themselves and, and get ready to, under, to, to listen to what you have to say um, without just shutting it out or shutting down. Um, and like I said, you can back off, you know, do this systematically. Um, you, can, you can say, you know, I know this can be uncomfortable to talk about, do you need a second? Or let's come back to this in just a minute. Um, or, or tomorrow, you know, whatever you need. It, that's, not, that's not off the table to, to do that if it's necessary. Um, and remember that you're not going to change someone's mind. That's not really true. Uh, it is possible to change someone's mind about religious belief in one sitting, but it's rare, and you shouldn't really go in with that expectation. A lot of the time, people who become atheists, uh, it's not really, in my experience, at least talking to people who, who have done a lot of this, um, often it's, it's not as simple as they just one day have one conversation and someone explain something to them in a, in a way that they haven't considered before and now they're an atheist. Usually it's a process. Usually it takes you know, weeks or months or reading some books or talking to people or meeting some people or uh, you know, an intensive journey of, of, of searching for this stuff before they're in the, the, the mental place where they're ready to consider it and then ready to accept that they've been lied to their whole lives and that this stuff is not true. Um, in my experience, you know, when somebody becomes an atheist, it's really because they've been thinking about this and talking about this and reading about it for six months first. Um, that is not necessarily true the other way around. It is actually quite common for somebody to become religious in an instant or in a day. Uh, they kind of have to be primed or prepped for it for us to live in a culture where it's socially acceptable um, or where they grew up often, you know, even if they didn't actually believe it, but they grew up with these beliefs being socially acceptable or, or familiar with them. Um, but there's a lot of people who, uh, who consider themselves non-believers or, or apathetic about religion and then had some experience that convinced them religion was true and that, that took, you know, 10 minutes. Uh, but it doesn't usually work the other way around, um, just to keep that in mind. So, um, just to wrap this up here, uh, that was all supposed to come up at once. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm on social media. If you guys want to contact me to talk more about this, I will most likely be tabling tomorrow. Um, and I've got uh, some books and stuff that I can bring and some literature if anybody's interested in any of that. Um, it is 8.15, uh, but does anybody have questions or want to talk about anything that I said? I can go back on the slides. Uh, yeah? What are your thoughts on street epistemology? I think it's great. I think uh, any discussion about this type of stuff is useful, not just for desensitization, but to help people flesh out why they believe what they believe and reject things that that they can't justify. And I, I think it's really important, you know, I, I don't really hold it against anybody who believes what I consider to be false things as long as they have an excellent justification for why they believe what they believe and it's supported by good evidence. Um, I used to believe this stuff. I thought I had really good reasons for it. And the reason that I stopped believing, if you ask, if you ask me why I stopped believing, uh, was because I found out that the evidence that I was using was wrong. Uh, I had been told things and I was reading books and looking at research that was biased and uh, had an agenda, but I wasn't aware of that. And by reading uh, scholarly research that showed that this is biased and has an agenda, and you know, like I mentioned earlier, um, there's not one magic bullet that will you know, convince somebody that religion is wrong, there's not one best reason. And I gave the example of the history of the New Testament. Uh, I, I genuinely believed when I was a Christian that Christianity was true because it was substantially historically accurate. And I learned that that isn't really the, the view of mainstream scholarship. Um, and what changed my mind was reading mainstream scholarship. Um, and, uh, you know, street epistemology that, that helps people flesh that out or at least gets them 
started down the path of researching this stuff. I don't see any downside for that, uh, as long as it's you know voluntary and, and people are doing it at their own pace and so on. More realistic, objective. This is a lower the knowledge and confidence. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A deconversion on spot. Right. Just, it, mm -hmm. and, bring it down by a point or two. Right, yeah. and and that's really like you know an important that that you know we talked about confidence you know in the statistical sense of uh, or the technical sense. It's um, when people say that uh, they have faith in something or that you know, atheists have faith too. I, I don't have faith in anything. And you know, to kind of to paraphrase Matt Dillahunty, you know, if you, can, if you can point out something that I believe on faith, I will stop believing that. I, I mean, I don't want to believe anything on faith. I want to have good reasons for the things that I believe. And, uh, and, and I only want to believe things for which I have evidence for and good evidence for and good reasons for. Um, and the example that I like to use when somebody says atheists have faith too, you know, I say, I don't, I don't have, and I, I like to use the example of a chair. Um, so I'm sitting in a chair right now, and I have a knowledge, is insofar as it's possible to have knowledge about things, uh, that this chair can support my weight. And I have really strong evidence of that because of doing it. I don't have as strong evidence that that chair can support my weight because I'm not sitting it, and I have never sat in it. Um, but considering that it's like in this room and hasn't, you know, been thrown away and nobody stuck it in a corner with a note on it that says broken, uh, I can be reasonably confident that that one will too because they're the same design or similar. But, you know, but I have confidence in that. That's, that's, it's based on evidence and, and a logical line of reasoning. And uh, that's a very different concept from having faith in something. And if you could show me that this won't support my weight, you know, Carla weighs a lot less than I do. She sat in it and it broke. Then, no, my confidence would drop a lot lower than it would support my weight at that point. Um, you know, and that's, that's, I think, a good way to approach just life in general, that everything that we think is true, we have to consider with some degree of confidence. And the more evidence we have for that, the more reasonable it is to be confident that it's accurate. But you should always, always be open to... Uh, changing your mind about every belief that you have, um, with very few, if any, exceptions. Uh, I mean, I, I believe that I exist and I don't think that I'm going to ever be shown wrong about that, um, as long as I'm alive. But uh, for every other belief that I have, aside from the Descartes one, um, yeah, it's just degrees of confidence. I think that's, that's a good way to look at things. Does anybody else have anything they want to talk about? I'm not in a hurry. I mean, if, I'm happy to just chat about this stuff if you'd like. Are we all set? Mm -hmm. Yeah? I'm not totally sure I agree with the assertion that you can have a sudden conversion to religion, mm -hmm. but not from religion. Well, it, yeah. To be clear, it's not that you can or can't. It's just, in my experience of talking to people, uh, it's, it's more common that it's a process of of becoming an atheist um, over time and over over research, or, you know, months or, or weeks or just time spent researching this and learning about it and so on. Uh, there are certainly exceptions on both sides. There are people who become religious over a long period of time, and there are people who uh, become uh, atheists instantly. But I think there kind of has to be, or at least usually there is in my experience, uh, a cultural kind of priming for this type of stuff. Um, the religious priming yeah. is it's it's a cultural more thing. inherent cultural right. kind of thing. Yeah. So priming exists. Yeah, and and there's also some you know, arguably biological kind of uh, I don't want I don't necessarily want to call it priming, but um, there are biological reasons that we fall into these traps uh, of belief. Um, Michael Shermer writes about this and why we believe in some other related books about uh, agenticity and what is the other one called, patternicity. Uh, so this is kind of an interesting topic. Um, agenticity is this idea in evolutionary psychology that uh, it is evolutionarily beneficial for us to assume agency even if there might not be a conscious entity behind something. So he gives an example, if you're you know, a caveman and you hear some leaves rustling. That, you know, it could be, I mean, it could be more than two things, but for simplicity's sake, 
It could be a saber-toothed cat that is waiting there to eat you. It could be the wind rustling some leaves, and you don't know. And there is, there is a point where paranoia costs you more energy than it's worth to always assume that it's a saber-toothed cat. If you spent all your time running from imaginary saber-toothed cats, you, you would never have time to mate and pass on your genes and you know, feed yourself and, and whatever. Um, but there's a sweet spot, and the important point is that the sweet spot is on the side of assuming that it's a saber-toothed cat. Um, between this 50-50 shot of it's not dangerous or it is dangerous. And so basically his point is, uh, between those two choices, it is dangerous, it's not dangerous, uh, evolution favors leaning toward assuming that it's dangerous, uh, or more to the point, assuming that there is a conscious entity behind something. And the application here to religion is that when there's something that, that doesn't have a consciousness or agency behind it, but is scary, like, you know, lightning, uh, it's, it's natural to take that concept and apply it and say there's an angry god up there who is throwing down lightning bolts because we pissed him off and, you know, uh, if we want to make him happy again, you know, maybe we need to, to burn some really high quality meat and send the smoke up there so he can smell it and, and appease him. And of course, you know, with science and meteorology and so on, we know that that's not why lightning bolts happen and why thunder happens and so on. But if you don't know what thunder is and you don't know what lightning is and all you know is that it's fucking loud and that sometimes it starts fires uh, and you know, and I can understand how it would be scary and I can also understand how lacking any kind of scientific context for this, you might assume agency there. And uh, that's his argument for part of why uh, God belief is a you know, universal human trait, at least in, you know, originally. Uh, and then the other thing is patternicity, which is where we assume patterns exist even when there aren't necessarily patterns. And this is just heuristics, basically, this concept that uh, it's, it's a time saver to assume that a pattern exists um, rather than trying to figure out every single situation from scratch every time we run into something unexpected. Um, you know, if I'm, if I'm speaking at a college campus, uh, I don't have to assume from scratch every single time, you know, I, I know even if I've never been to a parking garage before, I know what the concept of a parking garage is and I know that they probably have visitor spaces there and that if I can't find any other place to park, that that's a safe bet. And it, it's, you know, that's an assumption that I'm making as a, as a time saver and so on. Uh, and, and we make those same kinds of assumptions uh, all the time. Um, and we can be wrong about those, and that's important, is that we, we don't rely on those assumptions as true. And before the scientific method, and before uh, we really started, you know, in, at least formally understanding logic and fallacies and so on, the reason that I think fallacies are such a problem is that uh, unless you're really trained to think about them critically and, and how to identify them, they're really easy to fall into, they're intuitive, and that's kind of the problem. Uh, if you're not accustomed to or trained to think critically, um, you you can really easily fall into thinking fallaciously, and that's why it's so important, I think, to talk about this stuff and to to discuss logic and to discuss uh, fallacies and and examine our beliefs, uh, you know, systematically. Make sure that we have good evidence for what we're talking about with street epistemology and so on. That's my take on it. Do you disagree? I mean, I'm, I'm, I want to, you know, yeah. I mean, there's a certain thing, the argument about heteronicity, mm -hmm. you can make the same argument that that's why you would logically, not, or not even logically, just emotionally not believe in God, because if you spend every day on your knees praying right. and never get an answer, there's your pattern of kneel, pray, nothing, kneel, pray, nothing, kneel, pray, nothing. Right. So that should, towards the atheism thing, and then, you know, when grandma drops dead, unexpectedly, and, you know, you, okay, so screw God, you know, yeah. God doesn't give a shit, you know, done. Mm -hmm. You can have that same kind of thing as, uh, you know, I walk outside and, you know, I want it to be a good day and it's sunny. I want it to be a good day and it's sunny, and you get that, right. and there's a... God that cares about you and things like that, and, you know, or maybe there's something there that the universe likes you, 
and then something just freaking amazing happens after you know you made this offhand prayer, and then okay, so God is real, and you have that sudden conversion to religion. Right. It can go both ways. With yeah, the whole sure. Patternicity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the agency thing's a little bit weird, but I mean, it doesn't necessarily a lot of things make it a religion. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's. I think I think atheists have been around. I would say longer than religious belief has been around. I mean, you know, philosophical atheism, as far as we know, dates to 600 something BC in India. But the concept of lacking belief in God is the, is the strict definition of just lacking that belief predates the belief, somebody started believing that and spread that idea. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, and there, there have always been, you know, as long as there's been belief, there's been people who didn't buy it um, because of those types of reasons and that type of thinking. Um, what's his name? Uh, David Wolf, I think, uh, wrote this book called Anthropology of Religion. It's a, it's a textbook, but he talks in there about the, the two basic reasons that he sees as an anthropologist uh, for why religion started to exist and, uh, and one of those still applies today and why he thinks religion is still around despite its obvious drawbacks and shortcomings. Um, so he talks about this, this idea that uh, originally, before, you know, pre-science, pre um, religion served one purpose of explaining things that we couldn't explain um, and you know, providing stories, and I actually I do a whole talk about this part of this too. Um, but you know, providing an explanation for stuff that we had questions about. We're, we're naturally curious animals. We ask questions, and before we had a scientific way to answer those questions, we still wanted answers. And some people have this radical idea of maybe we shouldn't make something up. Maybe we should, you know, not believe anything until we know better. But uh, but religion, you know, it has these, these creation mythologies and stuff that, that answer those questions. Um, that's not the only reason religion exists, though. I mean, obviously. Uh, the other major reason that he talks about is this in-group, out-group thing, uh, group bonding, and the sense of community, and culture, and ritual, and rites of passage, and all of the stuff that goes with that. And when we look at today, you know, I mean, in, in the age of scientific understandings of things, uh, it's very clear that the religious explanations, I mean, to people who have studied even cursorily this stuff, that the scientific answers uh, are much more in accordance with evidence than the religious answers to these questions about reality. Um, but if, you know, if that were the only reason religion existed, then religion would have died off in the 1600s or something. But, uh, but it didn't. And I, th I think especially telling is the fact that even in very scientific, atheistic cultures like, you know, Scandinavia, a lot of people still have weddings in churches. A lot of people still baptize their kids. Uh, the rites of passage part, the in-group, out-group, the the cultural aspects of it are still important to people. And he talks a lot about that too. That uh, they kind of reinforce each other. Um, but yeah, I think that. Uh, there, there's a lot of cultural pressure to participate in religion, even if you don't believe all the, all the bullshit parts of it. Um, and because of that social pressure, because of that in-group, out-group aspect of it, uh, even if you don't believe that stuff, there's pressure to keep that to yourself, uh, sometimes implicitly and sometimes because you'll get executed if you say something. Um, yeah, but, but going back to what you were saying, though, I mean, there are absolute no question, exceptions on both sides. Um, what, I, what I really meant to say with that is, in my experience of talking to people and doing tabling and you know, discussing religion with people individually, uh, a lot more people are slower to come to atheism than they were to come to religion. Um, and, and a lot of people really, I think if you talk to them about it, they kind of have this, I don't want to say delusion, but kind of is, this delusion that they chose to be religious, that's not really how it works. If you're raised in a religious culture, like you were saying, you know, you're primed for these kinds of beliefs. And a lot of people have this like conversion experience or, or um, initiation into the religion, but like, it's not like they, they considered uh, 
in a neutral sense all of the possible beliefs in the world and chose the very same religion that their parents raised them to believe, you know, that's not how that really works. Um, as Richard Dawkins likes to say, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an enormous coincidence that the vast majority of religious people believe the exact same religion that their parents believe in. There's obviously a geographic component to this, uh, and it's either the biggest coincidence in human history, or, um, or people believe this because their parents taught them to believe it. And a lot of people, I think, are under the mistaken impression that they believe because they looked into it, when what they really did was um, read or, or consider what their parents told them and say, I guess, okay, fine, and accept it as true. Um, but that's why we do this stuff. I mean, that's why we, we introduce critical thinking and um, an exposition of justifications, too. It's like that joke about, you know, you give somebody a religious text and they'll study it for the rest of their lives. If you give somebody two religious texts, they'll be done in an hour. It's like, you know, okay, so they're both bullshit. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think, I mean, it's, it's different for every person and the timeline is different. And there's definitely priming, there's definitely cultural influences going on. Um, but uh, as far as how people self-identify, I think, in my experience, usually um, the becoming an atheist Especially in, in cultures where uh, you're, it's, it's a minority or even an oppressed, an oppressed uh, identity to be an atheist, there's the stage of learning about this stuff, of questioning this stuff, of considering yourself agnostic, of learning what the definition of atheist is, and then being a closeted atheist, and then um, being more open about that, and, and then you know it, it is kind of it lends itself to this kind of journey narrative, uh, whereas with religion. Um, that and, journey happens yeah. when you're six well, months old. Well, right, and, and, it's, and it really is in something like in a, in a rite of passage sense, it, it actually is a one moment to the next type of thing for a lot of people. Um, you know, for, for Catholics, you know, for example, I mean, you know a lot more about Catholicism than I do, but you know, I mean, there, there's a confirmation and like, that's, that's when, that, from that moment, you're like an adult Catholic and it's like a specific thing and they have, you know, um, the church that I, that I used to work for uh, had like they called it a building together. It was like a class that you took when you joined the church, and it's like a six-week class uh, where you learned all about what the church believes. And it's like that's a six-week process for people, and there's specific steps that you take, and then you are baptized, and now you are an official Christian. And that's it's like, a whole lot like boot camp. yeah, it really does. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of people would, if you ask them about, you know, at least the, the people at that church in that community they would identify that as a six week process to becoming a Christian. Uh, I would guess that it's actually a lot longer than that. It goes back a lot further in their childhood and in culture than that. Um, yeah, I think it's just a different way of looking at it. But as far as self-identity, um, especially because of the rites of passage thing versus the coming out of the closet thing, it's kind of lends itself to a shorter or longer time table. Squishy semantics. Yeah, squishy semantics, I love it. Anybody else have things I want to chat about? It's 8.35, I'm happy to wrap up if you'd like. Okay, um, yeah, please uh, feel free to, to follow me. I've got a YouTube channel. Um, for a long time I wasn't actually promoting my YouTube channel because it, I, I changed my name when I came out as trans and uh, YouTube doesn't let you change the name of your channel. Um, and I have like a thousand subscribers, so I didn't want to start from scratch. Um, so for a long time, I like I wasn't using it, and and that was just too bad because I like making videos. But uh, YouTube is awesome and was very nice to offer to change my URL, and I have my actual name now. Um, so I'm going to be starting, especially now that the you know we're back in in the semester. Um, I'm going to be making videos again, so please subscribe to my channel and check those out. Um, if you're actually, this is a good time to bring this up. If you're interested in the types of things that happen at Speaker Circle uh, with street preachers and talking to people and so on, there's a video on my channel uh, called "Yes, This Really Happens," um, and it's two hours of basically me with my camera arguing with Brother Jed and some other street preachers. Uh, and I, I didn't really intend for that to go on for two hours, 
but it actually went on for four hours. It went on two more hours after my camera battery died. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's interesting, I think, to, to kind of see the types of arguments that they make, and if you're interested in the types of responses that I gave you know, to, that, to that setting or to see how I, I talked about this type of stuff, um, I encourage you to check out that video. Uh, yeah. Thanks, everybody. I, I had fun. I appreciate you having me. Um, and connect with me on you know, social media and stuff. Love to be Facebook friends with you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I always feel so much smarter after you talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. I like talking to you guys. Uh, I'm going to give this book um, to, to you guys to, 